Welcome to the Great Detectives of Old Time Radio. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham. If you have a comment, email it to me, box13 at greatdetectives.net. You can follow us over on Instagram at instagram.com slash greatdetectives. And you can also uh, check out the Old Time Radio Discord server at greatdetectives.net slash chat. A reminder, as you're making your travel plans, remember johnnydollarair.com. johnnydollarair.com is a Priceline affiliate link, so you get all the benefits of going through Priceline.com, but part of your purchase price supports the great detectives of old-time radio at no additional cost to you. So remember, when making your travel plans, check johnnydollarair.com first. Well, now it's time for today's episode of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. While Johnny Dollar went off the air in January of 1952, it returned in July as a summer series. It was the second straight year that CBS had brought back a canceled detective series as a summer replacement program. The first year they did it in 1951 with uh, Gerald Moore reprising the role of Philip Marlowe. But we're going to go ahead and take a listen at the first episode of the Johnny Dollar Summer Series and the last available episode we have with Edmund O'Brien. The original air date, July the 2nd of 1952, and the title is The Amelia Harwell Matter. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, the refreshing, delicious treat that gives you chewing enjoyment, presents for your listening enjoyment, Edmund O'Brien as... Johnny Dollar. George Parker, Johnny, Corinthian All Risk. Sure, George, how are you? In need of an investigator. Can you take a case for us? I've been sitting here waiting for one. You've got it. Big policyholder on Cape Cod, Mrs. Thomas Harwell. She died from poison. Hmm, that's rare these days. I'll be over in about 30 minutes. Listen to the rest of it. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum bring you Edmund O'Brien in a transcribed adventure of the man with the action-packed expense account, America's fabulous freelance insurance investigator, yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. Yes, for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, it's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. The lively, delicious flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, helps keep your throat moist, and gives you a nice little lift. The good, smooth chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling fresh and alert, adds enjoyment to whatever you're doing. So for chewing enjoyment plus refreshment, Treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Expense account submitted by Special Investigator Johnny Dollar to Home Office, Corinthian All Risk Insurance Company, Hartford, Connecticut. The following is an accounting of expenditures during my investigation of the Amelia Harwell matter. Expense account item one, 250, cab fare from my apartment to the Corinthian building in the office of George Parker. Well, first, do you know the Harwell name? Are they the textile people? That's right, mm. strange sort of family. Fortune was built by the deceased father. She was his only child. He naturally had wanted his son to carry on the name and the business. So he trained her, Amelia. She took the man's place all her life. How old was she? Something over 70. And did she still head up the business at that age? She took a very active part. What about the poison? I haven't gotten any of the details on that. That'll be up to you. Anything on the surviving family? Yes, yes. I have it here. A husband, Thomas, a daughter, Maxine, and a son, Dexter. Here, you keep it. Got the ages and all. Thanks. From what I can gather, she was an extremely domineering woman. Ran her household like a factory. There must have been very little warmth toward her. Then, when you consider the fortune she's leaving and the insurance... How much did she carry? Too much. 150000 for the family and over 200000 with the corporation as beneficiary. Well, that kind of money you should have hired me earlier as a bodyguard. 
Expense account item two, $40, car rental, and $22, fuel and incidentals between Hartford and the Harwell Estate on the eastern shore of the Cape near South Wellfleet. The mansion was as solid as the family's Dun and Bradstreet rating. Heavy brick construction with turrets, shuttered windows, and massive double doors that opened into a coldly formal entry hall. The widower Thomas, as might have been expected, was the rabbit type. Pinch glasses, high stuffed collar with string tie and sparse hair. I was announced to him in the library where, from the wall, a life size portrait of Mrs. Harwell seemed to be keeping an eye on the proceedings. Well, how do you do, Mr. Dollar? Nice of you to see me, Mr. Harwell. That will be all, Bryden. Yes, sir. And close the door, Bryden. Yes, sir. Please sit down, Mr. Dollar. Thank you. Well, these things are always hard to start, Mr. Howell. I'm accustomed to bluntness, Mr. Dollar. Besides, I've talked about Mrs. Harwell for almost 50 years. I see no reason to hesitate now, because she's dead. She was poisoned, you know. Yes, I'd heard. But I don't think she minded. You don't think she minded? Mrs. Harwell was an invalid. She had a very short time to live. I didn't know that. Oh, very few people did. She hardly admitted it to herself. Mrs. Harwell was a very strong woman, one who despised weakness, yet made everyone around her weak. Neither of these points have been released to the papers, the illness or the poison? No. Due to a friendly gesture by the police, she's been spared notoriety. She wouldn't like it to be known, so it isn't. Was she in pain, Mr. Howell? She never told me. Do you think she could have taken the poison herself? I hardly think so. That would have been an admission of defeat. I see. Do you have any idea how she could have gotten the poison, then? You're asking me if I suspect the children, and you're finding it difficult to do so. Is that correct? It's hardly a pleasant thing to bring up. The time for delicacy has passed. I'm afraid I don't approve of my daughter or my son at all. Oh? They're the worst sort of rich men's children, or rich women's, I should say. I was never allowed to be their father. All they've had is a mother. They have no gumption, no ambition. They've been overly educated and have developed nothing but insatiable lusts for their mother's money. And it's too late to change them. Without it, they could not exist. I understand they live here. They do. I should have Bryden call them to the drawing room if you wish. That won't be necessary right now. What about the servants? Well, there are eight. Mrs. Harwell settled a small amount on each, but unfortunately they are above suspicion. They are common people, and as a result, good. Did Mrs. Harwell have a nurse? She wouldn't hear of it. Well, certainly a doctor, then. Yes, Dr. Stevens in the village. Mm, thanks, Mr. Howell. I won't take up any more of your time. You're welcome any time, Mr. Dollar. Please give Dr. Stevens my regards. Well, Mr. Dollar, the Howell case passes from my hands into yours. I wish you more success than I've had. Thanks, Doctor. Amelia was not only a hopeless cancer victim, but she was a stubborn old fool. I could have saved her life with surgery three years ago, but I made the mistake of advising her. An advice was something she could not accept. You've been friendly with them that long? I've tended them longer than that, but friendly has handled the word. I brought each of their children into the world, but have yet to use the given names of any of them in their presence, that is. Hmm. Oh, I'm glad to talk to somebody like you. I found talking to the old man a little rough. I'm used to survivors being sad about death or suspicious or something. I'm afraid that with Thomas, instead of a feeling of grief, it's something akin to passing from slavery into freedom. And the children, are they as worthless as he makes them out? I'd say so. Maxine, the oldest, is a bitter, frustrated old maid at 33. And Dexter, 32, is an alcoholic and has just entered into an unsuccessful marriage. Do you think either of them could have killed their mother? I'm in no position to accuse any of them, but there is the inheritance and your insurance. Well, fine household. How long would she have lived? It's hard to say. Two months, possibly three. Does the family know that? I've been honest with them. Then why kill for profit? I don't know. Could it have been a mercy killing? I've wondered. It doesn't sound like them. You take a risk like that, but it's a possibility. What kind of poison was it? I don't know. I've been asked to attend the inquest this afternoon. If you'd like to call me at home this evening, I'd be glad to tell you what I've learned. Thanks, Doctor, I will. So far, except for lining the family up and accusing them one by one, I can't seem to map out a move. 
What about this marriage you mentioned? Dexter's? I don't know much about it. The girl's name is Gretchen Nielsen. She owns a small photographic studio just down the street. Small business, huh? It's below Harwell's standards, isn't it? That is probably the cause of the trouble. I don't doubt that Amelia wouldn't let her in the house. Through the plate glass window of her studio, Gretchen Nielsen looked like a girl anyone would enjoy having around the house. She lived up to her Nordic name, fine straight features, warm blue eyes, and a look of strength about her. I got her home address and knocked at the door of a small house 15 minutes after she arrived home that evening. Miss Nielsen? Yes? I guess I should have said Mrs. Harwell. My name is Dollar. I'm an insurance investigator working on the elder Mrs. Harwell's death. I'd like to talk with you. Well, I don't know anything about it. Why have you come here? Because I haven't found any place else to go. I'd rather not talk to you. Why not? There are things you don't want to say? All right. Come on in. I'm surprised I haven't been questioned before this. The police haven't started yet. It's probably why you haven't. I suppose that means I can expect to be dragged into it by the... I'd imagine so, yes. We can sit over here. You know she was poisoned, don't you? Yes, I didn't until Bryden the butler told me. I read about the death in the paper and phoned out there. Why aren't you living there with your husband? You have no right to ask me things like that, have you? You don't have to answer my questions, but it might be a good idea to get things out in the open. Why? Because there has to be a reason for Mrs. Harwell to die the way she did. Could your marriage to Dexter be behind it in some way? I don't see how. Wouldn't they let you and Dexter live together in the house? I didn't give them a chance to let me. They knew I'd never live there. What did they tell you? What did they say about the fortune hunter who lured and trapped their only son? You weren't mentioned. That's hard to believe. Why isn't Dexter here with you? Because he's a slave. He's too weak to be anything else. I hate myself for saying that, but it's true. Why'd you marry him? Because I love him. I thought we had something that would drag him away from that family that smothers him. But when the time came, he wouldn't leave them. Why not? Because his mother never taught him to do anything but hold out his hand for the money that was always there for the taking. He's uh, due to commit to some money of his own now. Quite a chunk. You led the conversation to this point, didn't you? Dexter would never kill for the money. There has to be a reason why she died. I think her husband did it. Why? To stop her suffering. I caught her off guard a few times. I know she was in pain. And I know she was frightened. Probably for the first time in her life. I think he knew that, too, and wanted to help. That could be. First, you sounded like you hated her. Now you don't. I feel sorry for her. Because she made so many mistakes. And now she's dead and there's... Nobody to correct them. I didn't string out my meeting with Gretchen Harwell and Nay Nielsen. I left, went to my hotel, and at seven phoned Dr. Stevens. His report on the inquest brought out, among other things that didn't seem important at the time, this point. The cause of death was a non-alkaloid poison administered in suicide or by person or persons unknown. The poison was hardly the type to choose either for suicide or a mercy killing. With what I had, I went out back to the Harwell residence. I'm sorry, sir. Mr. Harwell has retired. Is the rest of the family up? Yes, sir. I wonder if you'd tell them that I'd like to see them. Very well, sir. If you'll wait in the library, I'll tell them you're here. This is my sister, Maxine. How do you do? How do you do? Now, what do you want? I understand both of you were here the night your mother died. Yes. Yes, that's right. I've just gotten the verdict of the inquest. The poison that killed her was not a pleasant one. Did any of you hear any sound shortly before your mother was discovered dead? I didn't, and I found her. I went in to bid her good night. I didn't hear anything. I was in my room. Where's that? Just down the hall from mother's. What's the meaning of this anyway? 
The point is that your mother would have cried out. The poison would have been... Uh, what's that? It's father. He's in his room. Something's wrong. I'm going up to see. I went with them. We found Mr. Howell in bed, clawing at his throat and staring at the ceiling. When I bent over him, he moved a hand towards a glass of water on the bedside table. I picked it up and smelled it. I'm no chemist, but I didn't need to be to know that he'd been poisoned. Friends, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Gum. Chew Wrigley Spearmint while you're working. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley Spearmint gives you a refreshing little lift. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley Spearmint gum helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied. Makes your job seem easier. Chew Wrigley Spearmint gum in your home, when you're out walking or driving, when you're enjoying outdoor sports and other activities. Wrigley Spearmint gum tastes good anytime. And the natural chewing aids digestion and helps keep your teeth bright and attractive. Yes, wherever you are, whatever you're doing, you'll enjoy chewing Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. And now with our star, Edmund O'Brien, we bring you the second act of yours truly, Johnny Dollar. I tried to read something in the expressions of the son and the daughter as we stood for a moment around their father's bed. There wasn't much in them. No surprise, no fear, no satisfaction. Maxine looked a little embarrassed and left to phone Dr. Stevens. Dexter looked a little vague and said he thought he knew where a medical book was. And I was left alone with Thomas Harwell. I'm all right. I'm all right. Call them back, Mr. Dollar. I'm all right. I won't die. Of course you won't. I'm all right. How much water did you drink? Not very much. I was so thirsty, too. But I think I smelled it. I only sipped. I felt a terrible burning in my throat. I could hardly breathe. Who who would do this to me? I was hoping you could tell me, Mr. Harwell. We won't talk about it now. Dr. Stevens is coming out to have a look at you. Mm. I'm glad he's been called. He's my friend. Anything I can do for you in the meantime? No, no, thank you. I'm going to be all right. I'm not ready to follow, neither. I'm not ready yet. I took the glass of poisoned water with me when I left the room. I put it on a table in the hallway outside his door and stayed with it until Dr. Stevens arrived. He spent about 15 minutes with Mr. Harwell, and then he joined me. It's all right. Where's the family? I sent him downstairs. Good. You said you had the glass? Yeah, here it is. Smell it. Hmm. Ah. There must be enough poison in this to kill a hundred people. He's a very fortunate man. Can you tell if it's the same stuff that killed his wife? Mm, I'd say yes. Conadine or some such. What did he say to you? Very little. I'm only his doctor, you know. But he did tell me that it was unnecessary for this to be reported to the police. Oh, I told him it would be absolutely unethical if I didn't. It sounds to me as though he's trying to protect the children. I guess they're used to that. By the way, did you notice the marks on his throat? No. It looks as if somebody has tried to strangle him. It's strange. I didn't notice. Will it be all right if I talk to him now? Oh, I think so. I gave him a very mild sedative, but it won't go to work for a while. Uh, do you want me to wait? Not unless you think you should. He doesn't need me any longer... And if you'll stay here in case of another attempt... I will. I'll call you if anything develops. Fine. Good night, Mr. Dollar. Good night, Doctor. Yes? How are you feeling, Mr. Harwell? Oh, quite well, thank you. Quite well. I'm glad you came back, Mr. Dollar. I want to talk to you. I'm glad to hear that. I, I spoke to Dr. Stevens... About not reporting this to the police? Yes. Why must he be so uncooperative? Why don't you want the police to know? 
Because no matter how serious the purpose was, the results were harmless. I want the subject dropped. Are you afraid of what police investigation might bring out? For the sake of the family reputation, I do not want their meddling. I intend to manage this in my own way. Tomorrow morning, I'm going to discharge all of the servants. You told me earlier that they were all above suspicion. Do you remember? Uh, until this attempt upon my life, I thought they were. It's hard to understand, Mr. Harwell. If you really think that one of the servants tried to poison you, you must realize that the same one killed your wife. Still, you want the matter dropped? I do. Amelia is gone, and I see no possibility that she will return because I bring about for myself and my family the unpleasantness of police interference. You may believe in your logic, but I'm sorry it won't work. It'll have to be reported. Then, young man, leave this house. I didn't want you here. You will never be allowed under this roof again. All right, Mr. Harwell. Good night. <laughs> I picked up my glass of evidence again and started downstairs. When I got to the entry hall, I heard voices and looked into the library to see the children, Maxine and Dexter. Their conversation had ended by the time I walked in. How is he? He's all right. Back to normal. What are you doing with that glass? I'm taking it to the police. They'll want to know if it's the same poison that killed your mother, and there's a chance of finding fingerprints Mm, on it. Here we go again. Your father didn't want me to take it to the police. Why shouldn't he want to report that somebody tried to kill him? You think he's afraid that one of us did it? Is that what you mean? It's come to mind. Get out of here, darling. I don't have to listen to this. Wait, Dexter, wait a minute. That's what he thinks. The police are going to, too. Then I'll listen to them. It's their business, but not his. I don't have anything to be afraid of. I didn't keep a three-month-old marriage secret like you wanted me to. And I didn't break the news to her by telling her that she was going to be a grandmother like you wanted me to. You think everything's wrong. Dexter, shut up. You're drunk. Oh, let him accuse you. I'm not going to listen to him. I'm going to bed. He drinks too much. Is what he said true? About the baby? Yes, it's true. And he's living here? Obviously. I met his wife. She seems to deserve better. Yes, she does. Dexter was here waiting for Mother to die. Because he knew she'd disinherit him if he moved out. And now, neither one of us had better say any more until we get legal counsel. I took the poison to the police and made a statement. Then I went back to my hotel. Two or three phone calls to Gretchen Harwell got no answer. So the next morning, I found her at a studio before the day's work began. What are you doing here? I tried to reach you last night and couldn't. What do you want? Somebody tried to poison Mr. Harwell. Oh. He's all right? Yes, I phoned you a number of times last night, but there was no answer. I was out. I stayed with a girlfriend. And you left a few things unsaid the last time we talked. Didn't you? You found out about the baby. Yeah. And you've come to congratulate me. How nice. I've been simply swamped with congratulations. Please, this has to be straightened out, and everything that's held back makes it harder. What does the baby have to do with it? Well, it makes a motive stronger than ever for Dexter. He wouldn't kill his mother. I was told he'd be disinherited if he left the family manse because of the marriage you kept secret. Where did you hear that? Came out last night. He didn't kill his mother. How about trying to kill his father? No. He was trying to help us. The father? Doesn't sound quite right. I know it doesn't, but it's true. Dexter didn't even realize it, but I did, and I tried to explain it to him. Mr. Harwell had never done anything in his life, but he tried to help us. Why? Because when he married her, he must have had a personality. His mother didn't approve of Dexter and me, but I think his father did. You didn't keep it a secret from him? For a little while, until I insisted that we tell him. And he kept it from Amelia. Do you know why? Because she was the dictator. When she was sick, she was worse. She'd think Dexter had waited until she was helpless before marrying the girl he wanted to. But she found out and was poisoned before she could do anything like dropping Dexter from her will. I don't care. I don't care. I'll even say that Dexter did have reason to kill his mother. But he never would. And not his father. You aren't trying to protect him, are you? Of course I'm not. I don't care how much I love him. I wouldn't want him if he were a murderer. I did a lot 
lot of thinking after I left her. It would have been easy to be swayed by her, and I took that into consideration. In my hotel room, I tried to line up all the points that had come out. Only two of them added. By phone, I tried them on Dr. Stevens. He was more agreeable than I'd expected him to be. It was just before noon the next day when once more I walked through the Harwell's front door. In here, sir. They're waiting for lunch. Mr. Dollar. Well, that will be all, Brian. Yes, sir. Mr. Dollar, I thought I told you not to enter this house again. You did, Mr. Harwell. But I thought the fact that I might save one of your children from a murder trial might make a difference. Which one, if I may ask? Dexter. I don't understand. I think we've had enough of this, Mr. Dollar. My family has been quite upset since you've arrived. I think we've had enough, too, Mr. Harwell. I wonder if I could talk to you in private. Who are you to ask that? No, Dexter, I think I agree with him. Please leave. But, Father, I You feel... too, Maxine. All right, Dad. Come on, Dexter. Sure. See if Dollar can tell him anything worse about me than he knows. Well, Mr. Dollar... You wouldn't like to see Dexter charged with the murder of your wife, would you? Of course I wouldn't. The police are ready to do it. And they've got a good case. You didn't think of that, did you? I beg your pardon? You didn't realize that you might set up a situation that would jeopardize your son. I don't think I understand. I think you do. You killed your wife, didn't you? I? You filled a glass of water last night to throw off suspicion and to get rid of the evidence at the same time. Mr. Dollar! If you didn't, Dexter is going to be brought to trial. I can promise you that. I saw the charges being drawn. They have everything against him, except two or three things. Oh? What are they? Something that was hidden behind those tall collars of yours. Scratches on your neck. Another thing that came out at the inquest. Bits of flesh under your wife's fingernails. And the fact that your children didn't hear anything the night she died. They all go together. You struggled to keep her quiet and she scratched you. You're a very observing young man, aren't you? Not necessarily, but certain things add up. Am I right? I could hardly deny it now. Yes. It made such a little difference to Amelia. Though I don't imagine the officials take that into consideration. They seldom do. But it made such a great difference in Gretchen's child. I've made many mistakes with my own children through deference to my wife. I'd hoped that I could help my grandchildren through strength. Strength enough to do what I have done. You are helping Dexter, too? No, helping the child through Dexter. I had hoped that Amelia, when she knew that her life was being given while hers was being taken, would be glad and approve, but she didn't. She asked for a lawyer so that she could change her will, and I knew what I had to do. I'm sorry, Mr. Harwell. There are many things to regret, Mr. Dollar, many things, but hastening my wife's death is not among them. Her life was decayed. The life she did not want that I did want. So fresh and new that doesn't even know what hope or helplessness can be. Forgive me, Amelia. Amelia. Forgive me. Expense account item three, miscellaneous, $35.85. Item four, same as item two, transportation back to Hartford. Expense account total, $122.35. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. Remember, friends, Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum refreshes you. Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum gives you real chewing enjoyment. The lively, full-bodied flavor of Wrigley's Spearmint cools your mouth, freshens your taste, sweetens your breath. The smooth, pleasant chewing of Wrigley's Spearmint helps keep you feeling relaxed and satisfied, makes whatever you're doing more enjoyable. Yes, for refreshment plus chewing enjoyment, 
treat yourself often to Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Millions enjoy it daily. Get a few packages and always keep some handy. That's Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum. Healthful, refreshing, delicious. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, brought to you by Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum, stars Edmund O'Brien in the title role and is written by Gil Dowd with music by Eddie Dunstetter. Edmund O'Brien can soon be seen starring in the Paramount Pictures production, The Turning Point. Featured in tonight's cast were Victor Perrin, John McIntyre, Herb Butterfield, Jeanette Nolan, Virginia Gregg, and Peter Leeds. Yours truly, Johnny Dollar, is transcribed in Hollywood by Jaime Del Valle. The makers of Wrigley's Spearmint Chewing Gum hope you enjoyed tonight's story of Johnny Dollar and that you're enjoying delicious Wrigley Mint Gum every day. We invite you to join us next week at this same time when, from Hollywood, Edmund O'Brien returns as... Yours truly, Johnny Dollar. This is the CBS Radio Network. Welcome back. Well, actually, I think a pretty strong episode for our listening of O'Brien to conclude on. It definitely has uh, quite a bit of the expected Edmund O'Brien tone, uh, but I don't think it goes over the top or goes too far with it. Uh, kind of the gloomy feel that I, I did think that some of the other O'Brien stories uh, could. This is a pretty solid story. Although there were clues pointing it to it being the husband, the one thing that really kind of made uh, that stood out to me is when the doctor said that there was enough poison there to kill 100 people, which I was kind of like, okay, is the doctor using hyperbole? Because I don't see how he had actually, if he'd actually drank any of the poison, he would have survived if there was that high of concentration. I also uh, wonder why he wasn't taken to the hospital, because even though he does appear to be fine, if he had ingested that amount, you know, had ingested uh, poison uh, of any sort, I, I think it would make sense to just go, go to the hospital, pump the stomach, and have him in for observation overnight. But I don't know, maybe that wouldn't have been a procedure in 1952. Probably his biggest failing as a killer was that he thought he could uh, just kind of throw weight around and have everything hushed up. And that just was not going to happen. The summer series of 1952 actually ran for 10 weeks. The other nine weeks are missing. There were a couple of stories that they had uh, done previously that were reused. Twice, in fact. The Yankee Pride Matter and the Mont Video Matter. Both were re-recorded for this summer series, but apparently from the research, uh, they were essentially re-aired the last two weeks of the summer run, which uh, it does sound like CBS uh, kind of playing around with the idea of uh, rerunning programs uh, and in, in for their 1953 Summer Detective series, they would actually do an all-rerun uh, series of episodes of Richard Diamond, which was not something that was done over radio unless it was a situation where uh, it was first-run syndication, and you might be playing a program that had already been played on another radio station. But this 1952 uh, series may have been experimenting with uh, rerunning programs and setting the stage for reruns during the summer. As for Edmund O'Brien, he had a career that was definitely headed to some good places, 
although uh, perhaps not the level of stardom that some might have expected for him. He played the lead in a couple of uh, television series, but really became known for his uh, supporting and character roles. And he won uh, both an Oscar and a Golden Globe for uh, supporting uh, roles, and would continue to be a presence in Hollywood for many years to come. Of course, we'll have another Johnny Dollar to introduce you to next week. Now, it's time for listener comments and uh, feedback, and we have a couple new reviews on the Apple Podcast Store. Uh, Deep Raider writes, I started listening to this podcast at least five years ago. I was immediately hooked. I didn't mind so much your talking because I never heard a word you were saying. I could only hear the peculiar tone of your voice. My mind has created an image of what you may look like, and I won't Google your image for fear that it will throw my mind in a loop fighting to put your voice back into the image it created. Uh, At any rate, I can't begin to express my gratitude uh, to you for the gift uh, you've given me every day over the years. I want to tell you... You thank you, Adam, for giving my father back to me. As a child, I used to try my hardest to lay still and listen in bed at night with him. Never once did I make it without being sent to my own bed because I was too fidgety. Now every night he pops to my mind and I feel peace. I have to say it was 26 years ago when he passed and I never dreamed about him until I started listening to your show. Now I see him all the time in my dreams. So much so that sometimes I find it hard to remember if he's gone or just ignoring me uh, when I wake up. Well, thank you so much. Uh, I appreciate the kind review and uh, so glad uh, to help make that connection. And as to the voice, that is a, that is a fair, fair point. I do actually get images of some actors in my head. Uh, like in my mind, for example... I always imagine Herbert Marshall as the man called X uh, with a mustache. I firmly believe the man called X has a mustache. Uh, it, it is something where there is no logic or reason to it. That's just the way it is. It does not matter that every week I uh, post a picture of Herbert Marshall. Herbert Marshall with no mustache. To me, his voice has a mustache. And that's honestly my conclusion. I think the man called X is a character who would have a mustache, and Herbert Marshall is a man who would have a mustache, and it doesn't matter whether he did or didn't. So I totally understand where you're coming from with that uh, mental image. And then we have this, uh, have another review. Uh, This one from Grandma from Minnesota. Uh, who writes, this podcast is exceptional. Adam gives insights into actors and even the writers. I love the recap of each episode. Not old, all old-time radio podcasts do that. It's a wonderful addition to the podcast. Five stars. Well, thank you so much. I appreciate uh, you uh, leaving that review. Now I want to go ahead and recognize our Patreon supporters of the day. And today I'm going to celebrate Patreon supporters who have been supporting the program for the past six years as of this month. And I'd mentioned this last month that seeing how long some people have been supporting the program, that deserves, I think, some special recognition. And because some people have already been supporting the show more than five years when this occurred to me, I'll be recognizing folks uh, who've been supporting us for six years until I've caught all of those folks up who I didn't recognize their five year. And I'll do another one of these next week for people who uh, have been supporting us five years uh, this month. I want to thank Helen supporting us at the chief of detective level of $30 or more per month. Chris and Jameson supporting the program at the detective sergeant level of $7.14 or more per month. Steve supporting the show at the Seamus level of $4 or more per month. And Doug, James, and Mick supporting the program at the rookie level of $2 or more per month. Thank you so much for supporting the show since June of 2015. Really appreciate uh, your support of the program over all these years. That'll do it for today. A reminder, if you do enjoy this podcast, uh, 
please feel free to rate and review the podcast wherever you download your podcast from. We'll be back tomorrow with The Silent Men. And then next Friday, a new era of Johnny Dollar starts with John Lund. In the meantime, send your comments to box13 at greatdetectives.net. Follow us over on Twitter at Radio Detectives. And check us out on Instagram, instagram.com slash greatdetectives. From Boise, Idaho, this is your host, Adam Graham, signing off.